partners Jay Cohen Gilbert and Andrew Cassoy co-founded B Lab in 2006. B Lab is a nonprofit organization dedicated to serving entrepreneurs using business as a force for good. B Lab drives systemic change through three interrelated initiatives. First, certified B corporations, a corporate certification for sustainable businesses and social enterprises that meet higher standards for social and environmental performance and legal accountability. Second, B Analytics, a customizable data platform that drives capital to impact investments by assessing the social and environmental performance of companies and funds. And thirdly, Benefit Corporations, a new legally recognized corporate form that changes corporate fiduciary duty, permitting companies to create shareholder values and social values. Prior to B Lab, Bart was president of And One, a 250 million basketball, football, footwear and apparel company. Bart is a Henry Crown Fellow of the Aspen Institute, a recipient of the 2014 School Award for Social Entrepreneurship, and a board member of the Fuqua Center for Advancement of Social Entrepreneurship, CASE, the Wharton Impact Investing Initiative, and the G8 Impact Measurement Working Group. Please I'll join me in welcoming Bart Poulin. Thank you. So the first thing that I realized is how I got to change that bio. I, does anybody have any idea what I do after hearing that bio? <laughs> Seriously, it needs some work. Um, you know, what I want to do with you all today is talk a little bit about how I ended up uh, running a nonprofit, a nonprofit focused on businesses using capitalism for change. Because the path um, isn't self-evident. I was a graduate of Stanford in 1989. Uh, and immediately went to the world of investment banking. Uh, initially on Wall Street, spent two years on Wall Street. Frankly, loved the work, didn't care for the people, and moved to Boston to pursue impact uh, or in, uh, investment banking in Boston for an incremental six years. And I had mapped out my plan. I was going to go back to business school, do two years of business school, and then find a a uh, venture capital firm with an operating bank. Join that venture capital firm, probably stick with them for maybe three, four years, and then hop over to a portfolio company. And the portfolio company I was looking for was a business that uh, was an industry that I cared about, and I had an interest in, and most importantly, offered me the opportunity to join a senior executive team, get some real equity, and be with people I admired uh, and uh, could trust over time. So about a month before starting at Harvard Business School, uh, I ran into my college roommate from Otero. Uh, I was at uh, Wilbur Hall, and uh, we were at a Stanford wedding, and he had started about six months earlier a brand called And One. Now, a show of hands, how many of you know And One? Okay, a good group. For those of you who don't know AN1, AN1 was a basketball footwear and apparel company. If you think about Adidas or Reebok and you took their basketball business and set it to the side and made it its own business, that was about the size of AN1 at its peak. We were competing for number two in basketball, far behind Nike. Nike dominated hoops uh, for my entire 13-year career at AN1. Uh, my College roommate had started AN1, and at the time it was about a half million dollar t-shirt company. And he was lamenting at the wedding that he was having difficulty finding a president for the company, that they had had some success, they were selling uh, trash talking t-shirts, and he could not find somebody to help operate this entity. And it seemed to me like all of a sudden my six year plan had been accelerated and been handed to me that it was sitting right in front of me, that I no longer needed to go to Harvard Business School, that I no longer needed to go to a venture capital firm, that I was joining an industry that I was passionate about with, frankly, somebody that I loved, who I'd spent four years with here at uh, Stanford. So I frankly called him an asshole and said, why didn't you call me? Why didn't you reach out and ask me to join as president of And One? By the end of the weekend, we had called Harvard, told them to keep the deposit, and I joined a half million dollar t-shirt company called And One. So it's hard to imagine how a guy coming out of investment banking and then running an athletic footwear company could end up in a space focused on uh, capitalism for change. 
But the leap, honestly, isn't that tremendous because and one was a corporate, socially, and environmentally responsible business. Not because our consumers cared, because they didn't. We were selling $85 shoes to 18-year-old ball players. It was just the type of company we wanted to run. It was a place we wanted to be proud of. It was a place that we wanted our employees uh, to also share a passion for. And as a result, we thought the best way to do that was to build an organization that everybody would want to be at. And what did that mean for us? Well, a few things. The first is that we created an environment for our employees that was uh, second to none. I mean, we had eight dogs running through the office. We had a full court hoops court at the back of the office. We ran every day at lunch. We had yoga classes in the morning. We had uh, second to none uh, benefit plans. We had uh, a mom's room, uh, short-term, long-term disability. Uh, we had no hours. You came to work when you needed to work. You were assigned a responsibility and expected to complete that responsibility, and therefore nobody punched a clock. If you were sick, you were sick. You didn't come to the office. Uh, we had kids running through the office. We had a full child care center at the back of the office. It was a family-centric business. We treated all of our employees as if they were part of our family. And to that end, we extended that approach to our factories overseas. We had about 10,000 people making our shoes and our apparel in factories in China and Taiwan. And we considered them also part of our community. So we had a fantastic code of conduct with uh, audits twice a year of the factories to make sure they were upholding that code of conduct. Uh, we also believed you could be a global business, but act locally. That meant that we gave 10% of our profits to charity every year. Almost always a charity in our uh, hometown of Philadelphia. We specifically focused on the community to whom we were selling our shoes. So it was an urban community, and we focused on education first with all of our money. Didn't advertise it, didn't put it on the hang tags, just wanted to give back to the community that was supporting us. Uh, we were just kind of awakening to what was happening with the climate crisis, and so we were dabbling in uh, environmentally friendly manufacturing and materials that were more environmentally friendly. We were kind of late to the game on that. But in general, we took incredible pride in the organization that we were building, and it resulted in a retention rate of 98%. Over the course of 13 years, and one lost 2% of its people. People didn't want to leave. They were proud to be there. They bled and won. And that approach to operating proved over and over again to not only be the right thing to do, but to be good business. And so I thought what would be helpful is to provide some examples to you all about places where AN1 was on the brink. And because of our commitment to our community, to uh, integrity and to uh, approaching all relationships like partnerships, we were largely saved by our <coughs> stakeholders. And let me give you some examples. Anybody know who that is? Just to show how old I am. Anybody know who that is? Came out the same year as Allen Iverson. It's drafted number four by the Minnesota Timberwolves. His name, I heard it. Stefan Marbury. Stefan Marbury. So Steph was our first footwear endorser. We began as a t-shirt company, as I, was, as I was mentioning, and we scaled to about 27 million exclusively in apparel, tees, shorts, sweats. And we were approaching this industry in, a, in frankly, in an inverted manner. Most uh, businesses in the space enter in through footwear and then move into apparel. We started in the apparel and moved into footwear. We signed Steph to the back of a cocktail napkin to a shoe deal when we had never made a shoe. And Steph joined us. He was, a, frankly, at that time, a great kid and wanted to be our Michael Jordan. Wanted to build and one to a Nike-type brand using an iconic endorser as the vehicle. Our challenge when we signed Steph was that 
We had never made a shoe. We didn't even have any clue on how to make a shoe. And he had just graduated from Georgia Tech, which meant we had about six months to get to market the Marbury One. So any ball players here? Anybody play ball? Wow. That kills me, man. Get out and play some ball. <laughs> so uh, some things to know about basketball shoes. Uh, the logo on the side of the shoe is somebody we called the player. He was the raceless, faceless embodiment of all basketball players. It was, frankly, uh, a huge uh, asset of ours with uh, ball players. We had over 18 NBA players with the player tattooed to their arm or their leg, none of whom we had under endorsement contracts. They simply put the player there because that's whom they identified with. They said, that's me. We knew it was the strongest portion of our brand. You can see it, for God's sakes, on the sock, on the shoe, and on the shirt. But frankly, by taking the player and putting it on the side of the shoe, what does that look like? Anybody seen the Spider-Man shoe? Right, with the, spy, the Spider-Man on? It looks like a kid's shoe. So first, we screwed up the design on this particular shoe. But secondly, even um, more embarrassingly, was our our ad campaign. So we got no ball players in the room. We uh, launched an ad campaign called Breaking Ankles with Stefan Marbury. Breaking Ankles with Stefan Marbury means that he crosses over his defender and his defender is so uh, deceived that he breaks his ankle trying to cover Steph. It's opening night. We have printed 10,000 t-shirts for all the uh, patrons in Minnesota to go see the first game of the season. We've created a nationwide billboard campaign called Breaking Ankles with Stefan Marbury. We've done an exclusive with Foot Action, who gets the shoe only. And in every store Foot Action across the country, right in the window, Breaking Ankles with Stefan Marbury. First quarter, Steph's bringing the ball up, breaks his own ankle. Breaks his own ankle. We had, you can laugh a little bit. That's, that's ridiculous, right? So we had $20 million of shoes on the water from China at the time. And we had a national embarrassment with an ad campaign. We called up Foot Action, who had been our number one vendor for three years, and said, guys, we don't have the latitude to cancel the order. We have to pay for the shoes. We don't have any equity cushion. What do you want to do? And Foot Action said, guys, you screwed up. You made a mistake, but you've been incredibly loyal to us for the last three years. You brought us this opportunity first. I'll tell you what, we'll take the shoes, we'll eat them, and we'll continue as your partner as long as you give us the Stefan Marbury too. And it was the first real evidence for me that you want to build partners, not customers. That you want to find folks who want to work with you on everything you do. And foot action with that decision kept us for the first time from going bankrupt. If they had canceled that order, there was no way we were going to pay 20 million, we could pay $20 million for our shoes. Our factories would have absolutely stopped production. We wouldn't have been able to pay the bill. They would have pushed us into Chapter 11. So you're going to hear a similar theme here as we walk through these examples. Uh, UPS, uh, we believe that we should be bootstrapped. Anybody know that term, bootstrap? What does bootstrap mean? Yeah, I, I couldn't quite hear, but it essentially means you haven't, you haven't raised any equity. There is no equity cushion. You're essentially uh, bootstrapping the business with your own capital. Okay, so and one grew to $250 million with raising a total of $2 million of outside capital. That's relatively unheard of. It means that you operate on a razor-thin margin start to finish. Okay? One of the things you do in a structure like that is you try to get rid of fixed costs and you deal with only variable costs. And what that meant for us is that we hired UPS to be our third-party warehousing organization. Okay? And they were phenomenal. 
they were phenomenal. They could adjust to the seasonality of our business without us carrying a lot of overhead of, of staffing and deal with our enormous uh, deliveries of back to school and holiday. And then there were times that we were relatively dead in the middle of the summer, as an example. Great partner of ours. Uh, and it turns out that uh, if you use UPS warehousing, not surprisingly, you have to use UPS shipping. Seemed totally fine to us. But with every order that we brought in, we had every shoe pre-sold. And what that meant was that uh, we would immediately take the product as soon as it landed and ship it out within two days to our customer, take the receivable, borrow against the receivable from our customer, and pay the factory. Bang, 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 bang. Okay? No margin for error. People follow? Okay? So it turns out that UPS warehousing is not unionized. UPS shipping is. UPS went on strike. First day, we were OK. Nothing's leaving the factory. Shoes are arriving one after another, one container after another into the warehouse. Getting processed by the warehouse, sitting by the door to go out, but no trucks picking it up. And because it was a UPS facility, you couldn't bring in yellow freight. You couldn't bring in another shipping agency. Wasn't an option. Second day, third day, sixth day. By the 10th day, we are dead out of cash. I've stopped payroll. Nobody's getting paid in the organization. We have about 120 employees at this time. And we're despondent. We don't know what to do. Because the factories are now saying, Where's the payment? The product has arrived. Our employees are saying, I have mortgages and child care and health care issues. I have to have a, an income. And we gathered the board to talk about what we should do and whether we should declare Chapter 11. And as the board was coming together, we got a phone call. It was from about 25 of our uh, employees who had rented U-Haul trucks. And they had backed up to the warehouse and said, we're going to deliver the product. These were people from production and from customer service and marketing and the sales team. They decided the company was important enough to them that they were going to take matters into their own hands. Got a call just as the board was coming together and said, Bart, you can invoice. We have about $6 million of product going out the door right now. And it became really clear to me that if you create a relationship with your employees of integrity and trust, and you invest in them, that they're like family. And they care about your business as much as you do. Third and final example. So remember how I was talking about we got the product in, and we invoiced almost immediately, and then we'd borrow against the receivable? So that's often called, it's, we actually sold the receivable and borrowed against that sale. It was called factoring. Okay? It's a type of, of financing that we did. And early on, when And One was small, about $6 million in revenues, we had a relationship with a bank called Southeastern Factors, A.B. Henley, president of Southeastern Factors down in Raleigh, Durham, uh, North Carolina. A.B. was phenomenal for us. Uh, we were growing really rapidly. Our revenue rates went from 600 grand to 1.2 million to 5.9 to 14 to 27 to 42 to 72 to 110 to 210 was our run up in revenues. And uh, for those who are going to go into finance or operations, one of the great challenges is how do you finance your business? And with each one of these great growth years, I was running out of room on our loan facility from A.B. Henley. A.B. was terrific, though. He picked up the phone. He said, Bart, as long as your assets are covering your loan, don't worry about it. I don't want to keep on doing the amendments with you. We were doing amendments like every three months to expand our loan capacity. So you have like a loan limit. And every, because we were growing so rapidly, we had to keep on increasing the loan limit. And A.B. said, just don't worry about it, all right? As long as you have receivables and inventory to cover the loan, you got no worries. I said, that's great, A.B. Probably 18 months pass. And I get a call from an organization called First Factors from their new president. 
first factors had bought Southeastern factors. And he said, uh, Mr. Houlihan, I want to introduce myself. Uh, I'm the new president of First Factors. We just bought Southeastern Factors. Delighted to have your business. But I was reviewing the loan documents, and I noticed that uh, you guys are out of, you're outside your covenants. You're above your loan limits. I said, well, oh, we are, but we're well within our asset coverage. We have plenty of receivables and inventory. He said, no, but you didn't hear me. You're, you're above your loan limit." I said, yeah, but A.B. Henley, he said, well, A.B. doesn't work here anymore. You're two and a half times above your loan limit. You have 30 days to raise a million dollars of equity, and if you don't, I'll take the equity. Now, to raise a million dollars in 30 days for any business is incredibly challenging. We ended up getting on a plane. And we flew to our factories overseas, and we sat down with all the factory owners and said, we're in a bind. And you guys have seen how we've grown, and we've stayed with you all this while, and we'll continue to stick with you. But right now, we need a million dollars, and we need it immediately. We need to close on an equity raise in the next 24 days, or we lose the business. Every one of our suppliers kicked in. We didn't have valuation even hammered out by the time we took the money down because it was moving so rapidly. And what became really clear to me again was build partners, not suppliers, and equally importantly, that not all money is equal. That capital providers are among the most critical of relationships you'll ever have as a business owner. And I didn't pay attention to first factors. They were not the same type of lender as A.B. Henley. Those are three of the six times that Ann One was on the verge of bankruptcy. Each time we were bailed out by our suppliers, our customers, our bankers, it was, and our employees. It was very clear to me that what had begun as simply a way of doing business that we wanted to be proud of was a better way of doing business. There were some other learnings, uh, however, that were not as positive over that 13-year run. The first was that it is really easy to be uh, socially and environmentally responsible when there's seven of you. It gets a bit harder as you start to scale. I get really challenging as you start bringing in new management where this concept is entirely new to them. We did uh, a leverage recap where we took some uh, risk off the table in 1999 where we brought in an outside investor, TA Associates. TA was phenomenal. They were um, entirely supportive of how we ran the business, but the truth is we were no longer playing with our own money. We took $35 million from TA Associates. There was a responsibility that came along with that $35 million. There was a legal responsibility that came along with that $35 million. And I was acutely aware of our fiduciary obligation to TA. And then perhaps most importantly, was it came a time for AN1 to be sold. The deal we did with TA was going to mature in seven years. We were about five years into our relationship. And we didn't want to be up against the refinancing. It was time to move on. Our management team, frankly, was tired. We had done this for between 11 to 13 years. And there needed to be new ownership. And it turns out that um, in US corporate law, when you actually get to the point of sale, you only have one legal obligation. And that is to maximize return to your shareholders. You don't have the latitude to consider anything else other than valuation and return to shareholders. The challenge that poses to organizations that are like in one, that have purpose along with profit as part of its mission, 
is there's no way to preserve that purpose at that moment that matters most, the moment of succession, the moment when you're moving on. And so, and one ended up being sold. And bear in mind, this isn't a story of lament. You know, I came out of an investment banking background. We knew what we were doing. We knew that we were selling the business. And I don't bear any ill will to the gentleman who bought the company. But whatever was left of our commitment to employees, community, and environment was stripped out of the company within six weeks. Within six weeks. And I got to the end of this really magical journey that I was so proud of and just felt like I'd been kicked in the teeth. And it seemed like there had to be a better way. There had to be a way for an entrepreneur who believed a business could do both, could make money and make a difference, to be able to scale, raise capital, have a liquidity event, and still hold on to mission. And the challenge was that the system isn't structured for that right now. It's just not. There are both legal and cultural issues that get in the way. So I'm sure most of you enter the world thinking that business exists because of the last 40 years with a single intent, which is returning value to its owners. That's become a cultural norm for all of us, including me. It's reinforced by what's called fiduciary duty. That as a corporation in the United States, you have a fiduciary duty to maximize value for your shareholders. The truth is you got a fair degree of latitude day to day. You actually can consider community, employees, and the environment on a regular basis. But again, at the, ma at the, at the moment that matters most, at the moment of liquidity, it's abundantly clear that you have no latitude. You must maximize shareholder value. And so as I was evaluating with that same freshman doormate what to do next, there were some, there were some clear um, concerns that we had. The first uh, was we knew that business could be a force for good, but it's not structured to support organizations who want mission and meaning and money in their business. Secondly, that there was an enormous amount of activity around businesses that were trying to do something beyond just creating shareholder value, but the more that those organizations claimed they were green, responsible, sustainable, charitable, local, frankly, without any standards, the less they meant. It was an incredibly fragmented space of all these people claiming to be uh, leading in a particular marketplace. And then third, we had a legal challenge. We had a challenge where the legal form of the United States did not support markets as a solution to social and environmental problems. So we started a nonprofit. Yes. Yeah. Oh, my microphone. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Anton. We started a nonprofit. The nonprofit was called B-Lab. And it had a pretty simple mission. We exist to serve the world's leading entrepreneurs that use business to solve social and environmental problems. We knew that these entrepreneurs were out there and they needed support. But frankly, that's all we really knew. So we launched this nonprofit with a fair degree of ignorance, quite honestly. And the first thing we learned was that there were the beginnings of a pretty robust marketplace already in place. There were 60 million consumers who said that they wanted to uh, essentially have their purchases align with their values. Some people call them conscious consumers. Secondly, there was almost $3 trillion of investment capital being uh, driven to socially responsible investments. That's one in nine dollars in the United States professionally managed. Now admittedly, not all of that is quality investment, but it all reflects an intent. 
And then finally, there's 100,000 businesses that were self-defining themselves as triple bottom line businesses. Anybody know the term triple bottom line? Who can tell me what triple bottom line means? Anybody? Exactly right. People, planet, profit. It's the easiest way to get there. It's exactly right. So there were 100,000 businesses that claimed to be triple bottom line businesses. That's a big market. Capital, consumers, entrepreneurs. Why was there really no activity happening in the space? The truth is everybody was screaming with their own voice. I'm organic. I'm fair trade. I'm a lead certified building. Uh, I'm an ESOP, an employee-owned business. Those are all manifestations of the same intent. Those are all folks trying to use business as a force for good. So we thought we could add some value to the space by introducing a unifying ingredient brand. Okay? Not very sexy, right? Unifying ingredient brand. Anybody know any other ingredient brands? What's an ingredient brand? Intel Inside, great ingredient brand. Any others? Dolby Sound, it's an ingredient brand. Obviously, Kosher, it's an ingredient brand. Okay? It's not the brand itself, it tells you something about the product. Okay? And we wanted to create a way to unite this very fragmented space to show that there was real activity there, that there was real energy of businesses using markets to solve social and environmental problems. And the best way to do that, we thought, was to provide an umbrella ingredient brand to unite fair trade, organic, uh, employee ownership, charitable, uh, local, all of these movements of organizations that are all using business to address some particular challenge. And we did it through a certification. It's called the Certified B Corporation. But there's one key difference about the Certified B Corporation is that it moves the certification up a level. So all those certifications I just mentioned, it's all about the product or a particular practice. Organic, it's about the product. Fair trade, about the labor practices. Okay? You buy an organic apple, it doesn't tell you a damn thing about who picked it. You go visit a business in a LEED certified building. Doesn't tell you how they're treating their employees. You buy fair trade coffee. Doesn't tell you about whether they're dumping the effluents out the back door of the river. We thought that you all cared no longer about buying good products but supporting good businesses. That the evolution of this market was moving towards you caring about the business itself. That organic was no longer enough, for fair trade was no longer enough, for lead certification was no longer enough. So we certify companies, not products. And we're looking for companies that are creating a material positive impact on society and the environment. They have met higher standards of social and environment performance as evidenced by something we call the B Impact Assessment. Every B Corporation's got to take an online test. It's about 200 questions. It adds up to 200 points, and you've got to get at least an 80 to be qualified as a certified B Corporation. Sounds like a calculus class, right? 40% pass rate? So yes, it's a low pass rate. But the truth is, what you learn really quickly is it's really hard to do all things well. That most of our companies walk through the door with an area of excellence, and then they got to show some degree of aptitude in multiple areas. If you're perfectly green, but you don't treat your community well, and you're not involved with your employees, you're not going to pass. If you're employee-owned, but you're not paying attention to the environment or the community, you're not going to pass. So all the companies on the screen have all passed this test, demonstrating that they've moved the needle into positive territory. They've actually created a positive impact. It's not that they did no harm. They added value to society and the environment. That's the first thing they all have to do. Secondly, the problem with most certifications, it's evaluating past performance, including our test. We're evaluating what kind of impact they made last year. The challenge that we were trying to address, if you remember, was 
how to make sure that mission's preserved. Not that they just are meeting higher standards of social and environmental performance, but that we know that evidence of higher of social and environmental performance has been built for the long term. So every B corporation is required to rewrite its corporate governing documents. People familiar with the term LLCs, limited liability corporations? Yes? No? Yeah, some nods, okay. Uh, C corporations or S corporations? These are different type of corporate structures, okay? All of them have some governing documents that tells the organization what its requirement is, what its purpose is. We require all B corporations to rewrite the purpose of the company to include consideration of stakeholders. So no longer can they ex exclusively focus on shareholder value. They must consider the impact of their decisions on the community, on the environment, and on their workers. Anybody been in a, a board meeting? Okay. So typically in a board meeting at the end of the table is the general counsel. He's there to make sure the uh, organization is acting in compliance with its corporate governing documents. And to date, when the decision came up about whether they were going to move the manufacturing facility, it was the obligation of that GC to make sure that the company is considering whether it's actually going to maximize shareholder value and considering the long-term value to shareholders that be created. Simply by rewriting this article, that attorney at the end of the table has a new obligation. Wait a minute, guys. We at least got to talk about how this is going to impact this local community. Are they going to have the same environmental standards that our factory currently has? What's going to happen to all of our employees? We at least got to talk about that before we move the plant. Fundamentally, what it creates is the opportunity for these companies to maintain mission if there's new management, new money, or even new ownership. It gives them the opportunity at liquidity to take a lower offer because that offer comes with stronger stakeholder support. We have had this certification in market now for about seven years. We have 1,000 certified B corporations. They hail from 33 different countries and 80 different industries. What I'm most proud of of this list is its diversity. Some names you obviously uh, recognize, some old school names, right? Ben and Jerry's in Patagonia up there, kind of stalwarts of the social responsibility movement for the last 30, 40 years. But also there are some new economy companies. People know Warby Parker? Okay, so Warby Parker is a buy one, give one model with eyeglasses. Really phenomenal organization, scaling like wildfire, uh, that is uh, delivering vision into uh, uh, India through an organization called Vision Spring, would be a great speaker for you guys. Jordan's phenomenal. Uh, people know Etsy. Some nods on Etsy. So uh, Etsy is essentially uh, the eBay for um, crafts, uh, artisan works, uh, and uh, antiques. And it's essentially created millions of new entrepreneurs who are using this vehicle to reach new markets. But you also have up there a CHCA. So this is an organization in uh, the Bronx. It is delivering quality home health care. Home health care has been a difficult industry for decades because uh, people have moved to the lowest common denominator in terms of what they pay people who come into home unless it's a skilled nurse. If it's somebody who's coming just to help somebody who's infirmed at home, that market has been driven uh, incredibly uh, to the lowest common denominator in terms of talent and labor pool. They decided they wanted to change that entire marketplace. They hire low-income women in the Bronx. They train them to be quality home health care delivers, and then they give them an ownership position. All 2,500 employees have a share of CHCA. It's an employee cooperative. Uh, another example that's not up here, anybody uh, know Grayston Bakery? Anybody here eat um, what it's called, triple chocolate chunk Ben and Jerry's ice cream? Anybody know that one? Right? Pretty good ice cream, right? Big chunks of brownies in the center. 
Yeah. So Grayston bakes the brownies. Grayston's um, tagline is, we don't uh, bake brownies to employ people. Well, hold on, I'm going to get this wrong. <laughs> we don't employ people to bake brownies. We bake brownies to employ people. So they have something called their open hiring policy. And what that means is the next person who shows up at the door when they have a job vacancy gets the job. There's no interview. There's no screen. That means they hire the indigent, the homeless, battered women, people coming off of wealth, welfare, ex-cons. They use their brownie factory as a way to introduce people back into society to give them a marketable skill. And their top customer, Ben & Jerry's. So what you see up here are big and small companies. You see them having a variety of different impact, whether it be employee or environmental or community focused. You see service providers, banks, insurance companies, uh, consumer product businesses, food companies. Anybody can be a B Corps. Any company can be a B Corps. In fact, we have no prohibitives. There is no industry that shows up that we say, you can't be a B Corps. Quite intentional. For 35 years, people have been talking about socially responsible business. They've largely defined it by what it's not. It's not peak oil. It's not big tobacco. It's not pornography. The truth is, to build a movement, you have to stand for something. You have to believe in something. And fundamentally, every one of these companies is standing for a positive alternative. Most recently, we began our growth internationally. Um, the certification began in North America. And uh, about two years ago, we brought it down uh, to South America and found a great partnership down in uh, Latin America. And in less than uh, 18 months after launch, they have 120 B cores with 250 in the pipeline. And what we have found is that this idea of business as a force for good is not at all exclusive to North America. In fact, I'd probably uh, conclude to date, at least, that we're behind, that North America is behind, that when you look specifically at Latin America and you have the largest disparity of wealth on the planet, you have an economy that's largely driven by natural resources that need to be sustainably harvested. You have a government that is strapped from a capital perspective. And you have a very rich academic uh, environment. You put all those together and you stir and you have an absolutely ripe market for business as a force for good. Based upon that success, we opened Australia this year. We opened Europe this year. We opened the UK this year. We're moving into Africa and Southeast Asia probably in the next 18 months. Once this community was formed, and we had an example that we could point to, we thought the most important thing we could do was to move this to the systemic level. That we had a certification that provided total clarity about those companies that were really walking this walk. Those businesses that clearly were good businesses rather than just having good marketing. But the long-term objective was to change the system. And to change the system, we had to change the law. It meant we needed to create a new legally recognized corporate form. That if current corporate law demands that you maximize shareholder value, we had to essentially create a new form that allowed you to do both, to make money and make a difference, where you were given the permission to create simultaneously shareholder value and social value and where you were held accountable for doing so. We came up with the idea of creating something called a benefit corporation. So there's C corporations, there's S corporations, there's LLCs. We created a benefit corporation. <laughs> the first time we passed benefit corporation legislation was about two and a half years ago. It's now been passed in 27 states. 
uh, most importantly in Delaware, uh, last August. Anybody know why Delaware matters? I, I saw her give you an elbow, man. You got to answer now. Why does Delaware matter? A lot of companies incorporate there. A lot of companies incorporate there. It is the home of American corporate law. Uh, about, uh, I believe, 50% uh, of all public companies and 75% of all Fortune 500 companies are incorporated in Delaware. Okay, and it actually ends up being the basis of corporate law for many international marketplaces. So getting Delaware over the hurdle was a big hurdle. But the most exciting thing about this new corporate form is it's completely bipartisan. In 18 states, it's been unanimous. Not a single vote in opposition. We've had, I see you grimacing, you don't believe me. Do you believe me? <laughs> So are you surprised that it's not every state that we didn't get 27 unanimous votes? Well, yeah. Well, it, it, so we'll get back to who opposes it. But before we get to the opposition, you know, imagine a single piece of legislation that has both uh, Andrew Cuomo and Bobby Jindal having huge press conferences because they're excited to announce it. So why do you, let, let's break this down. Why do you think the left cares about this legislation? You have an idea. I saw you nod your head. Why do you think the left likes this? Because it's good for the environment. It's good for the environment. It's good for society. It's addressing disparity of wealth. It's addressing climate change. Why does the right like it? It's good business. It might even be an opportunity to shrink government, right? You're taking some of the challenges that government has been trying to address, and in some cases not so well, and moving it to the private sector and empowering the private sector to address these challenges. In fact, the way that we position this legislation is that we're just getting government out of the way. All we're doing is removing legal impediments that have standed in the way of entrepreneurs who want to make money and make a difference, and they couldn't do it because of the law. If you had investors and entrepreneurs who wanted to operate this way, why would you stand in the way? The right loves this legislation. Who do you think votes against it, to your question? Anybody want to guess? We've had some trouble with the Tea Party. We've had some trouble with the Tea Party, principally because uh, in some, and I don't want to exaggerate, in some cases, Tea Party doesn't want anything to be passed. And so uh, we've had difficulty uh, in some markets uh, getting through the Tea Party. Not in all. You know, this passed in South Carolina, uh, and Vicki Haley was out uh, having the same press conference. So uh, it is not uh, universal, but we've had some challenges on that front. But I have to say, honestly, um, the work we're doing is generational. It's um, not about a certification. The certification's a means to an end. Uh, it's frankly not about a new corporate form. It, too, is a vehicle to meet a broader mission. It, at the core of what we're doing is we're hoping to redefine in a generation success in business. That the way that we all evaluate what it means to be a successful business today is we evaluate net income and earnings per share and PE multiples and quick ratios and debt to equity ratios. In a generation for all of us, that has to change. Business needs to be about something beyond just creating private wealth for individuals. Anyone want to guess what percentage of GDP, approximately, is from the private sector, is from business? Take a stab. Come on, somebody throw out a guess. What do you think? GDP percentage from private sector instead of government and nonprofit. Close. A little higher, 75%. I think it's 77. Folks, if we don't get business engaged to address the challenges we all face, we got no shot. We got no shot. There's no way that government and the nonprofit sector, as much as I admire them, as much as I think they are absolutely necessary, they are insufficient. They cannot act with the speed or scale to address the challenges we have in front of us. We have to get business engaged. And to get business engaged, we have to change what it means to be successful. We have to use different metrics. 
So our theory of change, what we're trying to do is we're trying to create a gold standard, the B Corporation. Make it really easy for all of you to find them, to patronize them, to hopefully go work for one. Okay? And demonstrate that that not only is the right thing to do, but it's also good business. So during the financial crisis, over the course of the, those five years, the certified B Corporation was 64% more likely to survive. 60, that's not a rounding error. 64% more resilient. Second fact you guys probably are a, a, a acutely aware of. Millennials are kind of done with checking their values at the door when they go to work. One of my, the great privileges I have is I, I, I get to speak to, to millennials a fair, a fair amount. And when I graduated in 1989 and I went to Wall Street, I rolled into my cubicle, I hung up my coat, and I hung up my values. I worked 100 hours a week, and then at the end of the year, I wrote a little check to the Boys and Girls Club to try to assuage my, my sense of, of self. I don't think you guys are signing up for that anymore. I think, I think you want some meaning in your work. At least the data says you want both meaning and money in your profession. And so when I give this talk to Fortune 500 companies and I talk about how operating in this fashion increases consumer loyalty, opens doors to new uh, sources of capital and should increase your flow of capital, nine, nine out of 10 in the audience pretty much aren't paying attention. But then when I talk about you, about attracting and retaining the next generation of talent, people sit up, <laughs> they pay attention. I honestly think this will succeed or fail on what you all choose to do, where you choose to work. And importantly, I'm not telling you you can't go to Goldman Sachs or you can't go to McKinsey. It's not what I'm saying. I'm saying when you get there, demand more of the organization. Expect an organization that is about something beyond maximizing returns for shareholders. Demand an organization that's engaged in its community, that pays respect, not just verbally, but in how they operate to their employees, and is at least conscious of the impact it's having on the environment. If you all do that, I do believe in a generation, we're all going to look at a, a set of financials and a report on a business that's going to have far more metrics than just financial return. Thank you guys. We have about 20 minutes uh, for anybody who has any questions. It's a great question. So most importantly, I'm not an expert, but I can tell you my personal choice and why I made it and uh, affirm for you that I'd make the same choice again. Um, I think business school and, and education can teach you an awful lot. I think entrepreneurship is particularly challenging to teach. I think entrepreneurship is about doing. Uh, and uh, that doesn't mean you shouldn't go back to try to get a degree in entrepreneurship. It means that I was offered a unique opportunity to do at the highest level with people that I admired and trusted uh, in an industry that I cared about. And if confronted with the same decision today, I'd do exactly the same thing. Uh, some things that I tell you about entrepreneurship, the few things that I've learned over both A&W and B Lab, is first, don't do it alone. That uh, if any of you want to start your own company, teams matter. Uh, I, it is very hard to find an entrepreneur uh, who can do it entirely on their own. So recognize what you don't do well. Be humble uh, in uh, assessing your own talent and surround yourself with people who are better than you 
at those things that you don't do particularly well. And then secondly, uh, don't be a pig with your equity. Share it. Uh, recognize that uh, everybody can be part of the long-term solution, and if you align it around uh, an equity uh, answer, I think it's a great thing. And then third and finally, uh, both at B Lab and AN1, we uh, have a mantra around best idea wins. And so it doesn't matter who. Anybody uh, familiar with the mixtapes, the N1 mixtapes? Or the N1 mixtape tour? That came from a 22-year-old intern. That's how we got that idea. It ended up being bigger than our footwork business. It was a 35-city tour that was the number one video game in the market. It was the number one cable television show, and it came from a 22-year-old intern. So best idea wins. And to get to that point, you got to create an environment where you prize failure, literally, that you have to encourage people to fail forward. Uh, and uh, we used to literally have celebrations around like crazy ideas that failed because if you're not failing forward on a regular basis, you're not moving fast enough to keep up. We had one guy who came out with a onesie for, uh, uh, for, the, for the court. It was just terrible. And it failed miserably. And we had this great party. Another, we were the first to do a sleeveless t-shirt. And then uh, the same guy came out with a, a one-sleeve t-shirt. Figured that you, know, you had to keep your shooting arm warm. And the other guy looked terrible. Sold not a lick. Simultaneously celebrated uh, that. Because that's how you innovate. That's how you stay in front of the game. I have a question. What were the most common and strongest arguments made by those who opposed sort of the legislative Uh, the, well, I think there's a couple of things. I think there are some purists who believe that business should be about, you know, Milton Friedman's view of business that exists to return value to shareholders, and that's its only social responsibility. And then it's on the individual to uh, be philanthropic with that capital, and that there should be a clear delineation between business uh, and nonprofits. And I believe that is a rapidly shrinking uh, set of both academics and thought leaders. Uh, I think that um, viewpoint is uh, slowly receding. Uh, more often than not, if we get uh, opposition, um, it's usually not uh, vocal opposition to what we're doing because, frankly, we're aligning investors with entrepreneurs with consumers. So it largely doesn't impact folks who don't believe in our approach. Instead, what we hear more often than not is that's cute, and it's small, and it's irrelevant, and you'll never impact me. And so the, the, the largest uh, argument we hear uh, is around 1,000 big corporations. That's, you know, that's cute. And fundamentally, uh, we have an awfully long ways to go. If we view this as a marathon, maybe we're on mile two. But that being said, I think the dialogue is changing. You know, I, I think people talking about uh, business as a force for good is, is no longer fringe. And, and you can just look at, you know, when we started this in 2006, there was a set of leaders, but this was pretty out there. Uh, talking about uh, corporations with higher standards of purpose, transparency, and accountability was really quite unusual. And then we were given a gift. Everybody working in this space, who have been working on it for an awfully long time, were given a gift. And that gift was the financial crisis. Uh, Pre-financial crisis, not a lot of mainstream voices talking about higher standards of purpose, transparency, and accountability. Post-financial crisis, Bill Gates at Davos, Mohammed Yunus wins the Nobel Prize, the former head of uh, Goldman Sachs, teams with uh, Al Gore to create a multi-billion dollar investment vehicle generation that invests based upon sustainability. Uh, Jack Welch goes on NPR and talks about uh, the evolution of capitalism. Uh, Richard Branson creates the B team saying that capitalism needs a plan B. I mean, those are mainstream voices now discussing this exact issue. Uh, and so I would tell you, quite honestly, uh, a good idea is the beneficiary of an awful lot of luck. And uh, our luck was a financial crisis caused by the business community. Okay. Is it harder to convince publishing companies mm -hmm. to, to do what you're suggesting? 
Yeah. Accepting a lower rate of return for the shareholders. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, there's two th questions that you have in there. I'm going to parse them. Uh, the first is about public companies, and the, sec the second is about a lower rate of return. And I'm going to take the second first, that I disagree with the premise. So you, my friend, would be delighted to be invested in Patagonia. If you had had that investment for the last 20 years, you would have made money hand over fist. They're producing above industry returns, above industry gross profits. They're one of the most profitable businesses in the outdoor industry. And simultaneously, they are the leading organization in all of outdoor in the environmental world. And so I don't, there are certainly members of our community who are about poverty alleviation, where they've made a choice to take a market solution and apply it to poverty. They certainly should be accepting some lower rate of return. But the vast majority of the companies I had up on that screen believe that they are actually better off because they're considering all their stakeholders, that there's, in fact, no reduction of return, that they're going to end up in the long term returning greater value to their shareholders. And there's pretty clear research now that higher standards of ESG, environmental, social, and governance performance, actually mitigates long-term risk. So importantly, absolutely there's some social entrepreneurs in our community who are using for-profit vehicles to address a social need. But the vast majority of our, our community believes they're going to outperform their competitors, that you're going to go work for them, that they're going to get more capital because of their commitment to employees, community, and the environment, that they're going to have greater consumer loyalty, method home products, Etsy. Etsy, for goodness sakes, is I, I think they're doing something like a billion dollars of, of uh, commerce a month right now. It's just, I mean, it's exploding. It's exploding. So, the second part of your question, I'm not sure I agree with. The first part of your question is really astute. Because remember, to be a certified B Corporation, you need to not only meet higher standards of social and environmental performance, you've got to rewrite those corporate governing documents, right? Can you imagine how hard that would be if you're already a public company? You've got tens of thousands of shareholders all across the globe, and now you're going back to them and saying, guys, we're going to make a little amendment. Because an amendment usually takes a two-thirds supermajority vote of shareholders. So we only have right now one public B corporation. We have about five that are on the way. And the way that this is going to work is that you've got to become a B corp before you go public. It needs to be included in your red herring. It needs to be included in the offering. It needs to be abundantly clear to the shareholders that they're in this for the long haul. If you're looking for a quick flip, this is probably not the right investment. But if you're looking for long-term value creation, this might be a great opportunity. So gr great question with regards to the public company. It's a huge challenge for us. And so we had to figure out other ways to engage in large corporations. And to that end, Ben and Jerry's, it's owned by Unilever. So we can actually do subsidiaries. We have an organization called uh, Plum Organics. You probably saw them on the screen. Plum Organics is owned by Campbell Soup. Uh, New Chapter Vitamins is owned by Procter & Gamble. All three are B corporations. So we bring people in through subsidiaries, and through supply chain initiatives. Great question. Uh, so one of the core objectives of our, of our work is to address that, that exact challenge. Uh, so remember how I said that we had a test you had to take to qualify, and it was scored, looking at essentially how you impact governance workers, employees, and environment, and community? Um, that tool uh, is essentially a roadmap. And it gives you a, a numeric score in each of the different impact areas. And what we have found is that our B corporations farm it out to their actual staff. They have the supply chain folks work on the manufacturing piece. They have the HR department do all of the worker piece. They have the corporate secretary do all the governance piece. And they're now even setting compensation goals on improving the score year over year. And so initially, we built this tool literally as a qualifier. You know, take the test, 
you pass, you're in. We decided to make it a public good and leave it out there for anybody to use just to see what would happen. A thousand B corporations, 17,000 users of the assessment. Those 17,000 are using it as a free, totally confidential roadmap or guideline to improve their impact. It gives them a score. And not only does it give them a score attached to our case studies, uh, best practice guidelines, resources for them to move up the curve. We even give them an improve your score tool that tells them exactly where they can focus and how hard it is to do certain things on the assessment. That's what it's there for. And that, in fact, will end up being our vehicle of change. Shine a light on the best in class. Everybody shows up and says, well, how do I do this? I take the test. The test ends up being a do-it-yourself consulting tool to allow people to move up the curve, report back to their board, to their managers on how well they're doing. It's been really uh, one of the most rewarding things we've done is the, the early decision to make that free and available for everybody has turned into a, um, an incredible uh, change agent for us. The only thing I'd add is I, you, you said that impact is hard to measure, and it really is. It's really hard to measure. People actually track impact through uh, the inputs that go into the company, the outputs of the company, whether those outputs create certain outcomes for the individual, and then whether those outcomes create long-term impact for society. To measure impact, the impact on society, really, really hard. And we don't profess that our tool is capturing you know, whether we've changed society. We instead get to outputs almost everywhere. We can tell what kind of outputs are coming out of your company and even some outcomes. Better retention rates, better education for uh, employee families, but we don't get all the way to impact. It's really challenging and one of the great topics, uh, debatable topics of, of today. About the mm -hmm. How do you determine the weight of yeah. all the elements? Yeah. Yeah, so it's a really great question. So uh, first, we have 72 different versions of the assessment. Okay? The assessment depends upon how big you are, where you're located, and what industry you're in. To your point, the weight of the environmental section for a manufacturer should be very different than it is for a law firm. What we ask of a five-person company for governance should be very different than what we ask of a 5,000-person company. With regards to community engagement, what we expect of a company in Zambia should be really different than what we expect of one here in the Bay Area. And so based upon those three variables, you're delivered a custom assessment that should fit your particular demographics, location, and industry. That being said, your question still holds, right? How do I figure out you know, how I'm going to weight those different elements? And what we've built is, so there is a, there's been a wonderful body of work done about how to create a standard. Essentially, we're creating a standard. And there are some key elements about a standard that makes the process uh, meaningful for weightings and other things. The first is that every standard that has, that's worth its weight in salt, it has to be independently governed. So B-Lab does not govern our standards. We've actually employed a standards advisory council made up of 20 experts from academia, thought leaders, practitioners, and investors who provide their expertise. Secondly, whatever they decide needs to be transparent. You need to know exactly what you're being tested on and how every question is weighted. And then third, it has to have the humility to be dynamic. The only thing I can tell you about the assessment today is that it is wrong, and it can be improved. And what I can do is next to every question in the assessment, we have a leave feedback. You tell me, I just took this from my company, and this question doesn't apply to me at all. You've totally missed the boat on this. And when you come as an appropriate critic for what we've done, I can welcome you in and say, I can't wait to get your feedback because Every two years, we have a new version of the assessment. So it is dynamic. It versions every two years with feedback on the actual users. We just launched V4 in January of this year. V4 had 3,300 different instances of feedback from the community about ways to either change the weighting, improve the question, change the answer bucket, 
add whole areas we hadn't even thought about yet. And so I can tell you that I don't have a right yet, but that process creates one of continuous improvement. And it's all about iteration. We put an assessment out there. We get thousands of users over the course of the two years. They provide feedback. That feedback goes back into that cycle and improves the standard. I could probably have one more question. Incredibly challenging, right? The only, the only skill set we brought to this particular endeavor was how to build a consumer brand. And uh, I remember at one juncture we were uh, talking to Adidas about selling the company to Adidas, and they were asking about our marketing plan. We had at the time set aside $20 million for our entire marketing department and adver advertising for the year. And the CFO of Adidas cackled. He said, if we don't run a campaign that's four weeks long with $12 million against it, it's a waste of time. You can't move consumer consciousness for anything less than that. We're a $6 million NGO, right? Our marketing campaign in aggregate is probably less than a half million dollars. So how do we do it? Well, first you recognize that uh, consumer awareness is a process, it's not an event, right? It's gonna take time, and then secondly, uh, you use what you have. So the half million dollars that we have is actually always storytelling. We're telling, we're telling the story of this community over and over and over again. So whenever you see any of our advertising that we create, any of our marketing, it's always around storytelling where we control the story. More importantly, the second most important vehicle is PR. In 2013, we ended the year with, I think, 720 B corporations. Um, we had more than that in stories that year written by the press. I think we had 750 different articles written about our community. We're really good at generating press for this community. And if you can actually have somebody else tell this story, far more resonance. Third and most importantly by a lot, it's co-branding, right? So you put together the revenue base of all of those different brands, their social media reach, it's 30 million, a uh, 30 million. So we have 30 million consumers who are learning about B corporations through the voice of the brand that they care about, who are carrying the intellectual property on the side of their coffee bag, on the front of their retail window, on the bottom of their email exchange, on the back of their card. We fundamentally have given these organizations an identity, a new identity. And if you ask them why they joined us, there's a variety of reasons. Differentiation, capital raise, mission preservation, saving money, with one, however, commonality amongst all of them. And it's about leadership. People join us because they recognize in our platform an opportunity to have a voice louder than their own, to be part of something bigger than themselves. They got into business because they wanted to demonstrate they could do something beyond just create shareholder value with their company, that there was a better way to do it. All we're providing them is a voice and an identity, and therefore they're proud to carry the co-branding. And that co-branding blows away any other marketing that we have. Thank you guys very much for your attention.